If this were baseball tonight, we would be having a doubleheader. <laughs> Unlike the first five uh, Linton lectures um, this year, which had a single person to be presented and presented by a single person or a couple, this evening we have two, two Americans on the road to sainthood, and they will uh, each be presented by a different uh, individual. Tonight's saints-to-be are two Jesuit missionaries to the New World. The first to be presented will be Eusebio Kino, and our presenter will be Father Anthony Barrow. He, like Eusebio Kino, is a Jesuit, and our second speaker, also presenting a Jesuit this evening, will also be a Jesuit. Father Burrow's uh, education includes a Bachelor of Liberal Arts from Barry University in Miami in 1992. Six years later, 1998, he joined the Jesuits of the New Orleans province. In 2003, he earned his Master of Arts in Counseling and Family Therapy at St. Louis University. He completed his Master of Divinity in Theology last year at the Jesuit School of Theology of Santa Clara University in Berkeley, California. He has been pastoral counselor at the Office of Peace and Justice in the Diocese of Lafayette, Louisiana, where he counseled prisoners and enhanced communications between prisoners and guards. He has been youth counselor at Parroquia de Nuestra Señora de las Mercedes in El Progreso, Honduras. And there he counseled at-risk youth, presenting seminars on gang culture at local high schools. He is an annual spiritual director at Grand Coteau in Louisiana, where in 1866 uh, a nun was healed through the intercession of the Jesuit St. John Birchmans. He was counseling intern at the Covenant House in St. Louis, where he taught courses on drug awareness and provided career counseling. At Catholic Charities in San Antonio, he counseled Catholic Charities clients, provided counseling for local parochial elementary schools, and counseled at Guadalupe House, which serves homeless pregnant women. More recently, he has taught theology at Dallas Jesuit College Preparatory, where he designed a program called Toward Greater Freedom, which subsequently was used by the Diocese of Fort Worth for its deacon formation program. Uh, during the last couple of years, he has been spiritual director briefly at Montserrat Retreat House and continually at St. Agnes Parish in San Francisco. Last year, he became campus minister at Cristo Rey Jesuit College Preparatory here in Houston. There, he plans and conducts retreats for students and faculty, and he teaches theology. His professional interests include Ignatian spirituality, at-risk youth, and street gangs. In fact, he uh, has published a chapter on Honduran gangs in a book called Teen Gangs, A Global Perspective. He's interfaith advisor for the American Muslim. He's a computer buff. He designed, for example, the Jesuit Secondary Education Association's uh, online program. He loves to travel and has been to Mexico, Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic, Honduras, Yugoslavia, Hong Kong, and Nepal. I'd like to conclude this introduction by reciting a poem of his that I happened to cross as I was checking up on him on his website. Seemed appropriate, this is entitled Linton Cross. Amidst the flames and torrents of hell, my soul searches through this valley of tears, dying to myself and led to new life, 
Grace freely flows through this my Linton cross. Father Anthony Borrow. Welcome and thank you for coming out this evening uh, to hear about Eusebio Kino. Uh, a very interesting Jesuit, uh, one that oftentimes I think gets overlooked or very little is said about. Um, even among Jesuits, uh, he's not one of the, the major league players that we hear about. Uh, I am not an historian. Okay? That is not my forte. As a matter of fact, uh, with the number of sisters in here, you'll appreciate this. Uh, Sister Mary Ann Donovan was one of my history teachers in Berkeley. And at the end of my history uh, oral exam, she says to me, it's apparent to me that history is not your forte, <laughs> but you passed. <laughs> so for that, I was grateful. And so my hope is to be able to share some of the life and character of Eusebio Kino. And through doing that, give us an opportunity to reflect, I think, on some of these Lenten questions. Uh, and I think one of the, uh, the poem was uh, very apropos because throughout his life, uh, Kino had, it seemed like, one adversity or problem after another. Nothing ever really quite seemed to go the way that he wanted. Uh, You've heard a bit about myself, um, and you know I'll just highlight that I am a Jesuit at Cristo Rey Jesuit. Um, at Cristo Rey, the, it, this is a new model of education uh, for Houston. Uh, the idea is to provide education, private Catholic education, for low-income students or families that tend to be on the lower end of the economic uh, spectrum. And it does this by partnering with area businesses. And so we go to doctors and lawyers, uh, big corporations, and we ask them to fund one full-time position. And then four students will rotate through that position, working one day a week. And then on Friday, uh, they rotate through on that Friday. So they, they work five times a month. The money from that those jobs goes directly to the school to reduce the cost of tuition. And what it allows is for half of our students, they pay $25 a month for tuition. Uh, it's about $250 a year, um, which for a Catholic education is a pretty good deal these days. Um, and so I, I do, I serve there as campus minister, do a fair amount of counseling, and I teach a theology course. I'm a Jesuit of the New Orleans province. Uh, I entered the Jesuits in 1998, took vows in 2000, uh, and was just ordained this past June. Uh, so I still consider myself very much a baby priest. And kind of the joke for Jesuits is that you know, they say that uh, ordination is the reward for a life well lived. Uh, and our final vows is more like last rites. Um, <laughs> Uh, as was mentioned, I'm a computer buff. Uh, I love computers, I love programming. Um, and so I serve as the contributions coordinator for Moodle. Uh, Moodle is an open source course management system. Uh, and so uh, I'm happy to do that. Uh, I also enjoy practicing Tai Chi. Uh, I have done that for a while. I'm a big fan of Star Trek, uh, especially, especially T TNG. Uh, the Next Generation series with Captain Picard. Um, and so as you can see in this picture, uh, I've got my, my Star Trek uniform on and um, all of that. My students love that. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm not an historian, and this is not intended to be an historical uh, presentation. Instead, I wanted to focus on spirituality. Uh, and there are a couple characteristics of Jesuit spirituality. Uh, many of you who are familiar with Jesuit spirituality will be familiar with the phrase, finding God in all things. Um, there's a, a joke talking about how Jesuit spirituality is practical. Um, there were a Jesuit uh, Franciscan, and with uh, being that this is Dominican, I'll, I'll make it a Dominican, uh, playing cards, okay? And the lights go out, okay? And so the Franciscan says, oh, good brothers, 
let us take a moment to reflect on the importance of Sister Light in our lives. Uh, and the Dominican, being slightly more serious, says, well, let us also remember Brother Darkness. And uh, in the meantime, the Jesuit had found the circuit breaker and reset it. <laughs> the idea behind Jesuit spirituality is that it should be very practical about how we live uh, and looking to see how is God moving in my heart? Uh, how is God speaking to me today in the situations that I find myself in? Where am I finding consolation, light, and where am I finding darkness uh, that where I need to improve and grow? And there's this phrase of, uh, you know, to the greater glory of God, ad maiorum dei gloriam, uh, this idea of the magis. And oftentimes, this is mistakenly identified as the more. And people think of it as, oh, well, if we only go and do more, then we're doing the magis. Well, this is a, a, a terrible misconception because it's really about the greater. Uh, and so in Spanish, you have mas, which would be more, but you have mayor, uh, the, the greater, the better. And so it looks at it says, in this situation that I'm in, if I have two or three choices, which is the greater? Not the greatest, okay, but the greater, the better of the choices that I have before me. And you go down that path and see where it takes you. Uh, and then you reassess later and say, well, now where am I? And what choices do I have? And I think you'll find in reflecting on the life of Kino that he was a very practical man. And I think he got this from his Jesuit training. Um, very much just kind of looking and saying, well, what options are available to me? Uh, and sometimes that means doing things that we're not necessarily inclined to do naturally on our own or that we might not want, um, but we do them anyway. The other characteristic that I found as I was reading about him was an incredible patience. Uh, he was willing to accept people where they were, especially the Indians that he worked with. Uh, took them where they, where they were and then led them and guided them uh, to where he wanted them to be. Um, and so St. Ignatius has this expression of, you know, be willing to go in their door, but bring them out yours. Um, the other thing that I think Kino did very well was cura personalis, the care of the person, which is this Jesuit idea that you don't just, you know, as I'm teaching my students, I'm not just focused on their intellectual learning. Okay? I'm looking at the whole person emotionally, spiritually, mentally. So what does it take to get the whole person formed? So just a quick overview uh, of his life. He lived from 1645 to 1711. He was born in northern Italy uh, in the um, mountainous area. It was a small town. Uh, but from a very young age, he was very comfortable with farming, uh, you know, kind of tending crops and uh, climbing mountains. Uh, and so this is shown because he becomes a tremendous um, missionary in terms of just the amount of land that he covered, the amount of excursions that he went on uh, was absolutely phenomenal. Um, he was recognized early on as being a fairly bright young man. Uh, and so the family sent him off to a Jesuit school in Trent. Uh, which is a good opportunity for me to say, if you know any bright young men, uh, please send them to Jesuit schools. Um, he studied math and science uh, and became a cartographer, so making of maps uh, was kind of one of his specialties. Um, and so he eventually places himself at the service of the Spanish crown to go out and be a missionary and to be the royal uh, cartographer. He founded numerous missions in the Primera uh, Alta region, uh, which is now divided between Mexico and the California area there um, in the, the near Sonora. Um, he was educated in Germany uh, in philosophy and astronomy. Uh, Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz uh, was impressed by a book that he wrote uh, on the stars, on a comet that he had noticed while he was waiting for an expedition to go out. Uh, and dedicated that uh, to him. Um, he became a Jesuit in 1665 uh, and was sent to Mexico City as a missionary in 1681 
where he labored among native people uh, for the rest of his life. His early life, um, you know, as I mentioned, he was born in uh, Italy um, and studied in Trent, and then he went on to study in Innsbruck, uh, Australia. Um, while he was there, he became ill, uh, very ill, to the point of death. And he prayed to the intercession of the Jesuit St. Francis Xavier and recovered his health. As a result of that, he decided to kind of dedicate himself uh, to becoming a Jesuit and kind of following the example uh, of Xavier, who became his patron. He was chosen to be a missionary. Uh, he really wanted, like Xavier, to kind of go toward the Orient, uh, hoping to get to China. That dream was never realized. Um, instead, he was sent to Mexico. Um, and so he gets told that he's going to Mexico, gets excited about that. Uh, they get together, they get on the boat uh, to head to where they're going to be shipping out. Um, and the connecting flight was delayed. Uh, and so, as a result, um, he had to be rebooked. Uh, the only problem is it took about two years for him to be rebooked. So during this time, he figures, I'll, I'll go ahead and study Spanish. Um, so he masters the Spanish language, makes some other practical um, preparations, gets on the boat, the boat sails out, gets into harbor, uh, and gets stuck in the sand. Um, and then gets kind of battered about and damaged. Uh, and so then he has to wait six more months uh, before he's able to set out again. So the first kind of point of reflection or question that I put before you, how is it that we as Christians deal with setbacks and disappointments in our life? Uh, especially during Lent, uh, are we willing to accept and continue to push forward uh, even when perhaps we might break our Lenten promise uh, or uh, fall in some way. So how do we deal with setbacks and disappointments? Eventually he gets to Mexico uh, and is sent on uh, an exploratory mission to investigate this island of California. Uh, it was believed at the time that California was basically an island because there was the gulf there separating it uh, from the rest of what we know as Arizona now. Um, and so he goes in and, and starts exploring. Um, again, he had to wait a long time. His first encounter was with the uh, uh, Guaycuro Indians. Um, and the Jesuit who wrote about uh, his biography referred to them as having little clothing and less of shelter. Um, we get a very clear picture that the environment that Kino was sent into was a very hostile environment. Uh, not so much or just because of kind of some of the hostility of perhaps the Apaches and uh, some of the Indian tribes, uh, but just physically the terrain was very hostile. It was very dry. So he gets there and he starts learning the language and he was very good at sign language. Uh, and making gestures, and so he starts to learn things. And he figures, well, I need to teach them the creed uh, if I'm going to Christianize them. And so he gets to this term called the resurrection and doesn't have a term for it. Uh, so he's trying to learn what is it that the local people call this. Uh, and so what he does is he takes some flies and he has some method for stunning the flies so that they appear dead um, and then they come back to life. And so he says, you know, this is resurrection. Um, and so this is some of that practicality. You kind of have to work with what you have. Uh, and so the Indians were very impressed uh, by how he knocked the flies out. Um, and so basically the words that they used and then inserted into the creed meant they're dead. Didn't quite get to the new life part. Uh, so Jesus died and, well, he stayed dead. <laughs> uh, and so, again, a, a point of reflection. How do we respond when despite our best intentions, we're totally misunderstood? Uh, 
or we just don't have the language or ability to talk to people. Uh, it was mentioned that I was in Nepal. I was taking a course on Tibetan Buddhism and studying with some Tibetan monks. And one of the terms that there was a lot of translating going on, but one of the terms that really we had a really hard time translating was Trinity. Uh, how do you express three in one um, in Sanskrit uh, was, was very challenging. Um, and so even those who you know, kind of knew the language perfectly were like, well, we don't really know how to describe it. Uh, so we can run into great challenges as we try to share our faith, as we try to live our faith. You know, how is it that we express that, uh, whether in word or deed, uh, with others? So all seems to be going well uh, for Kino. He's uh, made some inroads with the Indians. Uh, and people are pretty happy. Uh, and then supplies start to dwindle uh, among the Spanish camp, uh, and they begin worrying about starvation. And so the Spaniards had noticed, you know, part of how they endeared themselves to the, the Indians were to give them gifts. Uh, and so some of the Indians decided that they would help themselves to some extra gifts of livestock and different things. Um, and so the Spaniards were very upset uh, that, you know, here we are getting ready to die and these Indians are stealing stuff from us. Uh, and so they said, well, why don't you come over for uh, a meal of peace? Uh, and during that meal of peace, uh, they fired a cannon. Uh, a Spaniard got upset and probably had too much to drink and he shot and killed uh, a number of them. And so with the threat of revenge, uh, Kino reluctantly retreats uh, and goes back to Mexico City. Um, and so he would have to make another uh, start um, in his mission work. How do we respond to betrayal? When we trust someone okay, and they turn on us, uh, or the institution that we've invested so much of ourselves in you know, all of a sudden takes a turn in a different direction, and it seems that we're being cut out. Um, and so, how do we deal with that? Uh, this Lent, I invite you to kind of, you know, sit and pray with that, you know. Are we able to forgive and move on uh, when we've been betrayed? Not be naive uh, about it and not forget, but to actually have the grace to say, well, it was a mistake bad things happen, let's regroup. This is one of the graces, I think, that, that Kino had. Um, his following mission is to the area of San Bruno. Uh, there, he enjoyed a fair amount of success. Friends were made, uh, languages were noted and learned, baptisms administered to infants and to the dying. Uh, I'm grateful that my mission here to Houston doesn't require me to learn whole new languages uh, and go, you know, baptizing all over the place and, um, you know, it's, and traveling. Um, I find it bad enough the 30-minute commute into work in the morning. Uh, I can't imagine, uh, you know, kind of what he endured every day, you know, um, going out on horseback to, to be to different places. Um, so things are going well, and then the seasons change, and drought comes. Uh, and there was um, a decision to abandon the mission. Uh, Kino was very much opposed to this. He made his case. He tried his best. Uh, but the choice was made, and since he wasn't financing it and the church wasn't financing it, he had to kind of dissent. Um, and, or, I mean, uh, consent to going along with them and, and to leave. So he goes back to Mexico City, and there's a ray of hope. Uh, there's a shipment of silver that comes in that could be used to help fund the mission. Uh, and then they discover that there was an old time debt, and so the royal treasury takes the money from the silver and says, well, we're going to use this to pay the French back because we sunk one of their ships, uh, and so you don't get that money. Um, and so he gets his hopes up and then has those um, kind of sunk. Uh, so he finds himself as a missionary without a mission. 
how do we respond to unforeseen circumstances or just plain bad luck? Those days when you're in a hurry to get somewhere and you hit every single red light imaginable, even lights that you didn't know were previously there. <laughs> so how is it that we respond to bad luck? I think one of the things that Kino teaches us is that, that spirit of just saying, well, this is where I'm at. I'm going to be courageous uh, and keep marching forward. So he gets sent back, uh, this time uh, not to California because people had kind of uh, given up on California as they basically inhabitable. Uh, it was very hard to land there. The waters were very rough. And so uh, they sent him to the other side, uh, which is now kind of Arizona. Uh, and since he knew the Indians, uh, they figured he would uh, be able to do well there. But he also had become very good at learning not only the, the ways of the Indians, but also the ways of the Spaniards that he was working with, the ways of the church, uh, the ways of the crown, uh, and he had a sense of what his mission was. And so I think we see him more seasoned, a little bit wiser as uh, he goes on, even more uh, amenable uh, to kind of making concessions early on that he may not have been uh, willing to make. Um, and so he worked uh, hard while he was in Mexico City. Uh, he'd heard about uh, some of the Spaniards that were enslaving the Indians and forcing them to labor in the mines. And so he kind of starts working the system a little bit and is able to negotiate it so that the Indians will get 20 years uh, you know, after they become Christians in which they don't have to uh, they cannot be forced into labor. Um, now, as you can imagine, with some of the Spaniards who were interested in using the Indians and maximizing on their profits, this would make Kino less than popular. Uh, and so this is around the time that we begin to hear rumors that, oh, the man will go and baptize anything or anyone. Uh, and so, um, you know, that he's really kind of reckless in doing that. Um, and so, some opposition arises. Uh, he'd always had a little bit of opposition, uh, even from within the Jesuits. There was a character that, that wasn't too kind to him and, and uh, a political figure as well um, that ironically he ended up giving a copy of a book that, the book that he had written on the comet. Uh, he gave to him and the uh, official kind of found this insulting, but fortunately for Kino, he was set to leave and was gone the next day before the guy could do anything about it. Um, but essentially, he's kind of frowned upon. He was not afraid to get himself and immerse himself into complex issues uh, or controversial issues. So during Lent, I think it's an opportunity for us to reflect on in our church, uh, what are today's divisive issues? Uh, as Catholics, how are we called to negotiate for those who are treated unjustly or oppressed? His life was not a total loss uh, or a, a completely a bunch of setbacks. Uh, he eventually came to work among the Pimas, uh, Indians who were really peaceful, uh, and that seemed to go reasonably well. Um, he learned to accept divine providence developed a great reputation of being a peacemaker uh, and an impressive pioneer. So the Pima Indians tended to be in smaller tribes, and he worked on kind of negotiating peace among them and having them uh, come together and cooperate. Uh, the fields that they began farming, even though the Indians had a long history of being very successful in cultivating the land, uh, he was able to help them improve upon that. Uh, and so that they s seem to have an abundance. Um, and the uh, kind of the, the enemies were kind of the Apaches uh, who tended to be a bit more aggressive uh, in trying to um, take what they could from the Pimas. Um, one of the, the Jesuit provincials, or Father General, um, likened Kino to St. Francis Xavier uh, just because he was 
going out there and uh, with that fervor of you know, just kind of driving and converting as many people as he could. Um, I also see similarities uh, between him and the Dominican Bartolome de las Casas uh, and the Jesuit de Smet, uh, who also worked among the Native American uh, populations here in the United States. Um, so I think there's a lot, it, it's interesting to me that he really does not get the, the fame uh, that some of these other names get. Uh, but I think in terms of his spirituality and what drove him, uh, it was very much that spirit, uh, a spirit that wanted to engage people where they were, uh, to offer them the best of what he had to offer, uh, to lead them to greater freedom, uh, and to help them live better lives. So there's a sense of some success. Uh, he creates some chapels, builds missions, uh, around that area, uh, and many of those uh, are still existing today, and you can uh, research the, the Kino missions and go and, and visit some of those. Um, a lot of what's there today uh, are not the churches that Kino built. Um, many of those things, uh, structures, kind of fell apart, um, and so uh, they fell apart, and the Society of Jesus underwent this little thing called the Suppression, uh, in which the order was uh, essentially um, tried to be squashed out. Um, and so as a result of that, the, the missions kind of fell apart and uh, you know, they're not there. But the Franciscans came in uh, afterwards and they did a great job of kind of building up and preserving uh, some of those places and building some really fantastic missions. Um, one of Kino's crazy ideas uh, as he was kind of out in the desert, remember that he was trying to get across the Gulf and find a route to California. Uh, and so he thought he needed a boat for this. And so in the middle of the desert, he starts building this boat. Uh, and people thought he was absolutely nuts. Um, and so eventually um, the powers that be said, enough with this foolishness, uh, and they suspended the project. Um, I think just another great example, you know, sometimes we start projects, and the Lord's simply not calling us to finish them. You know, we have to just trust and leave those on into other hands. Um, so I talked about how he united various uh, groups, um, and oh, then there was another unfortunate incident uh, one of the priests was martyred by the Indians. Uh, and again, the Spaniards came in uh, with a form of quick justice. Uh, and they kind of gathered people together saying, we're going to have a trial. We're going to find out who the guilty parties are. Uh, and then we'll um, you know, punish them accordingly. But the executions were so done so summarily that the Indians basically realized this is just a massacre. Uh, and so it really was done indiscriminately. Um, and again, uh, threatened peace. Um, Kino worked uh, toward that peace, uh, reestablishing that peace. A lot of, um, th there can be some misconceptions uh, about what it was like. A lot of the work that the missionaries did was based on them standing upon the shoulders of the missionaries who had gone before them. Uh, so it was a matter of reputation. Uh, and so very much so like, you know, we founded Cristo Rey Jesuit here. Uh, and we've been very fortunate that the businesses have been uh, extremely generous and receptive to us. A lot of that is not because of Father T.J. Martinez, who's the president there, uh, and as great and energetic as he is. But the fact is, it's based on the relationships that the Jesuits have established here in Houston over the years. And so Kino, likewise, stood on the shoulders of many that had come before him, and the missionaries after him kind of you know, st stood on his shoulders. I think that's a great reminder to us in our ministry in the church uh, that we do what we can, but oftentimes when we come in, we're trusted and received and respected not because of who we are uh, or because of our own accomplishments, uh, but simply because of what our orders have done before us. Um, and when we leave a work, uh, we entrust that work uh, to others as well. So after all of Kino's efforts, 
the Jesuits get expelled. Uh, many of the Jesuits were arrested uh, and uh, confined to quarters. There's uh, a story of them trying to ship them back uh, towards Spain, and um, I think about 30% of them died uh, during that, so they, they were treated fairly poorly. Um, and so in many ways, you could kind of look at Kino's life and say, after all that hard work, what, what did he get? What was accomplished? Um, in one sense, you could say it was a failure. Um, and yet, because the Franciscans carried it on, it really wasn't uh, a failure. And there were things like uh, discovering um, that there was a, a land path that California wasn't, in fact, an island. Um, some of the uh, discoveries there uh, were quite pioneering. So Mother Teresa once said, that we're not called to be successful, but faithful. Even if one concludes that Kino was not a success, he was faithful. How are we called to be faithful in our commitment, in our vocation? Some characteristics uh, of Kino. Um, these are some quotes from one of the books that I read uh, about him. The pace of the trip was typical for Kino. He had traveled some 800 miles in slightly more than three weeks. During the trip, he took time out to baptize nearly 400 infants, instruct others in the faith, and acquaint himself with hundreds of destitute papagos throughout the arid land. Incomplete records of his expeditions give a total of over 8,000 miles on horseback through the most hostile desert on the continent. Um, I've been in Houston uh, for almost a year now, and I've not baptized 400 infants, okay? Uh, so his pace was, was really quite impressive. What a marvel Padre Kino must have been to the Pimas who watched this man in his mid-50s pop out of the desert every few months, coming almost always from a different direction. So I think we see the story of a man who knew the paradox of the desert. He spent his life among backward pe desert people, turning river banks into farms, dirt into dwellings, and churches and dreams into living realities. So one of the, I think, ideas that's helpful for us during Lent um, is to remember a lot of times people look at the desert and think that it's a dead place, okay? but it's really not. The desert has quite a bit of life if you know where to look. Uh, so this Lent, let's take some time looking uh, in our lives for places that we may think are dead, but where really there are great signs of life. For those of you who are interested, uh, I have some resources. Um, Charles Pulser was the Jesuit uh, who wrote about Kino's history. Uh, he's, he is an historian. Um, there is also a Protestant theologian, uh, Herbert Bolton, uh, who wrote a couple of books on Kino and really kind of fanned some of the interest. Um, there's the Father Kino Story, uh, is a DVD available from Netflix, uh, and Kino, The Legend of the Black Priest, a more modern uh, version um, that are all uh, very well done. Uh, I mentioned that uh, he inspired Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz to write a poem. Um, if you're interested in that, uh, I have it. Um, she really just kind of marveling at how he um, was able to look into the skies and, and document uh, this comet. He brought peace and unity uh, to the Pimaria Alta region, put Arizona literally on the map. Uh, and. There are projects now that kind of continue in his name, and most notably is the Jesuit work, the Kino Border Initiative, uh, which is a collaborative uh, binational ministry with a foot in each side of the border. And I think this is one of those other lessons that we can learn from Kino, is that uh, he had his feet in both camps. You know, he was you know, serving the Spaniards and the church and also the Indians, um, and so kind of pulled between both. Uh, the Kino Border Initiative uh, is an innovative cooperative effort between six major religious organizations 
to accompany migrants in communities affected by the consequences of migration. Uh, and it's strategically located in Ambos Nogales, uh, which is southern Arizona near Sonora, uh, which is a major port of entry and deportation. And I'd like to close with a prayer by the Jesuit Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. Above all, trust in the slow work of God. We are quite naturally impatient in everything to reach the end without delay. We should like to skip the intermediate stages. We are impatient of being on the way to something unknown, something new. And yet it is the law of all progress that is made by passing through some stages of instability. And that may take a very long time. And so I think it is with you. Your ideas mature gradually. Let them grow. Let them shape themselves without undue haste. Do not try to force them on as though you could be today what time, that is to say grace and circumstance, acting on your own goodwill, will make you tomorrow. Only God could say what this new spirit gradually forming in you will be. Give our Lord the benefit of believing that his hand is leading you and accept the anxiety of feeling yourself in suspense and incomplete. Above all, trust in the slow work of God, our loving vine dresser. Amen.